joining us. Sorry, we had a little bit of a technical difficulty there uh, getting started. Uh, my name is Roy Wood, and I'm the Chief of Interpretation for Katmai National Park and Preserve. And to my right is Mike Fitz. Hi, everyone. Mike is one of the park rangers here, and he's going to be helping out a lot on the, the webcams and with answering your questions and, and doing various uh, things around Brooks Camp as well. So we're going to be here with you for the next hour or so and try to answer as many of your questions as we possibly can. And uh, as I understand it, the way this is going to work is you go ahead and post your questions either on Twitter or, or on the uh, explore.org webpage. And uh, there will be a moderator that will be looking at those questions and will feed them to us via Skype. So if we're looking away every now and then or look distracted, it's probably because we're trying to read uh, the question that's being posed to us. So um, let me see if we've got a question yet. Yes. Uh, how is uh, Patches and his foot? And I think you're probably referring to the bear um, that uh, is limping at Brooks Falls, and we see him quite often up there. Um, and uh, we've been calling that bear number 469, and I think he has been nicknamed on the website Patches. I've actually seen quite a bit of improvement with that bear over the past uh, couple weeks or so. He was limping very severely when he first arrived, and we don't know how that bear was injured. Uh, but yesterday, or a few days ago, I was up at Brooks Falls, and he was putting weight on his, his foot or his injured leg. Probably with every third step or so, if not. And some of you may have had the nasty that, that you know, suffered those kinds of injuries. We probably wouldn't recover without medical treatment, but we see that enough around here to know that bears are incredibly strong, incredibly powerful, and have a remarkable ability to heal themselves. And, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to be injured, uh, this time of the year is, you know, probably the best time in the summer and the fall. And we might even see him again next year. Some chirping. Okay, so uh, why are some bears darker than others? Is that just a difference in coloring, or is it indicative to a difference in age? Um, there, the color is genetic. So some bears are just blonder than others because that's just what they inherited from their parents. Uh, but they do color than they were when they were yearlings, for example. And one um, that I can think of in particular, right now, who's a young adult male, and many of you might be familiar with this bear from watching the camps, and that's um, number number 89, who's nicknamed Backpack. Uh, he, as a yearling cub, was extremely blonde, um, almost bleached blonde in color, one of the lightest colored bears I've ever seen. Ugly. He has also darkened over the years, and we look back from some of the photographs that we have of him going back to 2004, and he's definitely darkened as he's aged. And... Sometimes males uh, are darker than females as well. Um, it, it, usually the, the darker bears that you see early in the summer tend to be males. That's not always the case. But as a general rule of thumb, uh, you, can, you, can, you can look at a bear, and if it's very, very dark at this time of the year, it probably could be a male. But there are, of course, exceptions to all of these rules. So, um, so definitely, uh, yeah, as they age, they do tend to darken, um, and then sometimes males tend to be darker than females. And uh, third question, um, how many fish a day do the bears eat? Well, that's, that could be a hard one to, to answer, be, and you guys have probably seen some evidence of this, of why it's kind of hard to answer. Uh, when the season begins, they uh, tend to catch few fish, but eat almost the entire fish, perhaps the entire fish. As the summer progresses, we start to see them high grade more. And if you were watching last night, I think you would have seen 747 catch a dozen fish in the matter uh, of, of a, you know, an hour or so. And he mostly just ate the skin and the, uh, the fattiest parts of the fish. So he was high grading. And we'll see that as the, as the summer goes on. Uh, for the bears, it's all about getting calories versus the amount of time spent trying to get those calories. And so eating the whole fish while 
we consider the, the, the flesh to be tasty. It's not the, the most nutrient dense part of the, the, the bear, the fat dense part of the salmon rather. So um, how many fish a day is kind of hard to say. I think we estimate like on a good run of salmon, was it like 80 or 90 pounds of salmon it's a, a day? Yeah. It's a lot yeah. is, is what it is. Um, that's one to where to get the exact number, um, you know, I probably have to dig into some, some scientific paper, but I think all of our materials say between like 80 and 90 pounds of salmon a day they're capable of eating. Do they get that much every day? Probably not, but there are certain times of the year where they definitely do it. And if you had been watching the cams last week, you would have seen uh, hundreds of fish jumping per minute and very few bears. And during times like that, they probably are getting close to the 80 pounds a day because the fish were so plentiful. They probably get an awful lot in September also when the, when the fish are dying and are that much easier to catch. Later in the year, though, um, the, the salmon may be easier to catch because they've already spawned, but they're not as, uh, as energy rich. So um, a bear that catches a fish in September, for instance, will be getting maybe half the amount of calories out of that fish as it does right now. And that's why the Brooks River is so important to bears at this time of the year, because it's essentially the first stream in the region where bears can get access to these really energetic uh, pre-spawn salmon. Uh, before the salmon spawn, they're full of calories. Uh, they begin to digest themselves as as they reach their spawning grounds. They're not feeding right now. They're not replen replenishing the energy that they happen to lose. So it's definitely worth the bear's while to eat as much as they can right now because later in the season, they're not going to get the same return for a fish. Looking for another question. I, should, I could also mention too that um, you can, uh, when you're watching the cams, you can uh, you can definitely easily see what parts of the, the fish the bears prefer. Uh, a lot of a lot of the bears they typically will go for the skin, the brains, and the eggs. And you'll find that the eggs in particular are extremely calorie rich. I think I read one statistic that uh, suggested that the eggs were six to seven times richer in calories as an equal weight of salmon flesh. So if you were in a survival situation yourself and you had a salmon and, well, somebody gave you a choice, for instance, uh, and said you had to eat either the eggs or the flesh, maybe the, the flesh for many American palates would taste better, but if you're looking strictly for calories, you've got to go for the eggs. And definitely the bears know that, the birds know that, um, the rainbow trout in the streams know that as well. They will be gorging on salmon eggs too. So it's just not the bears that are focusing on these fish. Really, the, the whole ecosystem um, is based on, the abundance of it is, is based on the salmon. So we have another question that's come in. This one says, uh, I was wondering how often females with young show up to fish the falls. Was last night's mom just very hungry, or do powerful mother bears hold their own against the big boys? Uh, if you've been watching the falls and, and have tried to identify the bears, you've probably noticed uh, that most of the bears up there are males and tend to be the larger males. And that's typically what we see up there is the, the, the largest, most dominant males will, will be the, the most commonly seen bears at the falls. But we also do see um, females up there. Uh, there's some that will fish the falls fairly regularly, like 410 will be there. And uh, Beatnose has been known to spend a lot of time there. Milkshake, uh, a bear we haven't seen in a few years. Another female was there a lot. 402, the mother that was up there last night, also uh, fishes the falls very successfully. And uh, so as to the, the question about, it, uh, was she really hungry? Um, let's see, really, yeah, was, it, was she just really hungry? Uh, oh, I'm sure she's hungry. She's got three mouths to feed. You know, she's trying to nurse them. She's, she's trying to provide food for herself. But also an important part of, of being the mother of those cubs is teaching them how to, to fish successfully. So she learned how to fish the falls probably from her mother and is very good at it. When she doesn't have cubs, she spends a lot of time up there. And so for her, it's very natural if she thinks she can safely bring the cubs
there to bring them to the falls and uh, to fish where she can fish very well. And with that important lesson, uh, you notice that not a lot of bears are more regular supply of, of salmon fish are jumping. Uh, does it always work? No. She, you know, to that bear uh, waiting just to the left of the jacuzzi. So there are dangers there, and she going to describe it sort of like spooky aggressive. He wasn't running at them, but he was just staring at them, really focusing on them very intently. And she just launched into him, a much, much larger bear. And they had a, a, a pretty violent fight. The cubs kind of scattered, and the, one of the cubs didn't join the rest of the family until until uh, it was too late, and, and he did track the, the cub down and, and, and did kill it and eat it. Mike was actually there for that. I should let him tell the story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I, I wasn't up there. I don't remember if I was here or if I was in King Salmon, but I missed out on that. You can see, I'll say one last thing, you can see a clip of, of the fight in the uh, iBook that we have on iTunes if you haven't checked that out. Did you have anything to add to Um No, not, not really. Um, but I, I would like to remind everybody that um, the cubs do face a lot of risk earlier in their lives, and maybe as many as two-thirds won't survive their first year at Katmai. But that doesn't mean we're going to see bears killing cubs on the camera. It's a distinct possibility, and if you're watching the cameras and you see cubs, you should you know, maybe be prepared to watch some hard, hard realities of a bear's world. But they definitely... Um, uh, many of them de definitely have a lot of survival instincts that get them through that first year. Uh, it's 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 not an easy thing to see if, if a cub happens to get killed, um, but it's a very rare event. Um, and I've been working here since 2007, and I've only seen that that once. And we see it maybe during that time. I think it was just seen a handful of times. And we can have as many as 100 bears using the Brooks River during the month of July. So it's not something that we see very often. Uh, you can also, from the event that happened last night, too, you can see that the cubs face a lot of other risks, not just from, from other bears, but from flowing water, for instance. They do drown. They're not as strong swimmers as the adult bears. Adult bears are extremely strong at swimming, but they can. Uh, the cubs are not, so they may drown, for instance. They face predation from other animals, too. I've seen wolves um, actually go after um, a family of bears, trying to maybe separate the mom from the cubs, see if they would scatter. Um, so wolves uh, will take advantage of situations that they can as well, too. The cubs can fall out of trees, they can get sick, um, or maybe the mom would just have a really poor year. And those young cubs are basically relying on mom, and they're getting most of their nutrition from her milk, even at this time of the year. So they're only six, six and a half months old at most, and they're definitely relying on her more than anything else. So another question has come in, and that is, um, I didn't realize bears had three cubs. I guess I thought two was a lot. Is three average? Uh, in Katmai here, actually two to three is the average. Um, so it's suspected that uh, if, a, if a mother is uh, better, in a better state of health, I should say, then she's going to have a larger litter. Uh, there may be uh, some relationship between the number of cubs we see along the river and the number of salmon that come into the river uh, the previous year. If a, if a, a female uh, isn't well fed the summer beforehand, then she's typically not going to give birth. Bears uh, have a, a really remarkable adaptation that humans don't have, and, and some other mammals will have this as well, but it's called delayed implantation. You can find it in seals, you can find it in certain weasels as well. Uh, but basically the, the, uh, the bear maybe will mate at this time of the year, or earlier in the year, like May, for instance. And the, the egg... Uh, will be fertilized, but it goes into a state of arrested development. It basically just floats around in her uterus for a period of time until she goes to her den. And if she's a fat bear, she's got a lot of food in her um, throughout the summertime, then the eggs, uh, egg or eggs will actually implant in her uterus at that time, only when she goes to the den. So their gestation period is actually really short because a bear cub will be born, born in midwinter, probably February in this area. But if she is a bear that had a hard summer, wasn't able to find a lot of food, for instance, then her body um, will, will reabsorb those eggs. It's an unconscious decision, but really the pregnancy will be terminated. And she'll just reabsorb those eggs, and she won't give birth the next year. It seems like most of our bears around here are generally pretty well fed. And when we do see cubs, um, uh, the average litter size seems to be about two, two or three. 
And we, we have had four here on multiple occasions, and uh, we, do, we just don't have any right now that have four. So it's not really unusual for us to even have a, a, a larger litter. So the, oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. so uh, question number six, I was just going to read is, okay. uh, how does a bear earn his or her spotted falls? And that's always a great question because I think there's somewhat of a presumption that every bear strives to fish like the lip of the falls, that, that they work their way up through this hierarchy and eventually end up at that top spot at the falls. Um, they, they earn their spots at the falls either by being the only one that can fish effectively in that spot, wherever that happens to be, or by, by fighting or intimidating other bears out of that spot. Uh, but it is important to know that, that certain bears can only fish certain spots and it may seem like it's a, uh, it may seem like it's not the best spot. I mean, we see a lot of comments on the camera where people are saying that bear just needs to move over 20 yards and there's fish everywhere there. Well, it may not be able to move over because it doesn't really know how to fish tactically. You know, you'll see the ones in the jacuzzi. You sometimes see their shoulders moving. I don't know if you can see my shoulders moving. You'll see a little bit of this. And it's like they're feeling around in the water trying to find that fish and pin it to the ground or pin it to their leg. Um, some bears are very good at that, but would be terrible over where, like, Scaredy Bear fishes. He kind of looks for fish going through and, and lunges at them at the last second. And, and a lot of those bears could never fish the lip of the falls. So it's skill, it's size, it's, um, I don't know what... It, yeah, it's, it's learning. It's so complicated. It's, it's what their mothers yeah. taught them. Uh, the, the, each one of those places the bear has to learn to fish. Um, so I've seen younger bears on the lip of the falls, for example, get up there if there's not a more dominant bear fishing and they think, oh, hey, I'm going to try this, or mom tried it, I'm going to go try it myself, and, and they're not very good at it when they first begin. So sometimes the salmon will hit them in the face, uh, whatever it happens to be, um, or they fall off, too. It's, um, it's a, a spot where they have to be very careful about how they stand, and you'll notice, you'll see each bear that fishes the lip of the falls maybe likes to go to a particular spot on the lip and put their feet in the exact same place each and every time because they know that's where they can get a uh, stable footing and other because otherwise if they lunge they may end up um, falling off and then other spots at Brooks Falls um, are dominated a lot of times by the biggest most dominant bears on the river so if you're a younger bear for instance you just can't compete for spots in the jacuzzi typically because there's going to be bear like 747 or 856 fishing bear um, and they're not going to really give you your turn. They're going to wait, and they're going to get their fill, and then you're going to, if you're going to get a chance, it's going to be after they leave. And the bears don't, uh, they don't necessarily uh, remember uh, bears from years, or they don't give bears from years past the opportunity to fish there. So there's a bear uh, nicknamed Otis, um, who used to be more dominant. We see him on the cam now just sitting with his head down and sort of waiting for 856 or 747. Or, or ugly, for example, to move out of that spot because he's no longer as dominant as he used to be. So de definitely the hierarchy plays a, a crucial role in, in which bears fish where. One of the real remarkable things about the, watching the bears on the river here is that we know a lot of stuff about these bears on an individual level. Most other bear viewing sites um, in Alaska, for instance, doesn't, they don't have the, the amount of information about these bears as we do here. So you can really get to know some of these bears really, really well by watching the cams. And, um, by doing that, you can see where they fit into the hierarchy up at Brooks Falls. Uh, you can also see how different ones prefer to fish in certain areas of the falls as well, too. And over years, uh, hopefully we'll have the cams going for a number of years, and you'll be able to see some of those younger bears that maybe can't compete for spots up at Brooks Falls um, gain more confidence and gain more size. And over time, maybe they're going to be the ones fishing the jacuzzi uh, once 856 happens to age a little bit, and they can compete with them just a little bit more. So the, the next question we got on our Skype account is, who names the bears? And um, I don't know, I'd have to say probably their mothers. Right? <laughs> um, we, we give a number to every bear uh, as part of our, our records of their, their behavior, of their reproductive success, uh, their activities around camp, everything. You know, we need to be able to track them in, in, um, in our, our data that we use for our bear management efforts. Uh, but also to communicate amongst ourselves so that we can alert people to the presence of a bear. And it's, a, it's important for us to know the difference between, uh, you know, a young sub-adult and its behavior around camp and a large 
you know, potentially aggressive male who's pursuing a female uh, for courting purposes. So we, we gave them all, um, all the, the numbers as part of that, that effort. Uh, over time, some of the bears have physical traits behaviors that we that we uh, use to help apply nicknames to them and we try to do that somewhat sparingly we don't want to turn our, all of our bears into stuffed animals or for people to think of them as being any less wild because uh, a bear gets a name of uh, well we use cinnamon you know that's sort of a you know warm fuzzy kind of name we also don't want the other side of that we don't want every bear to be named killer brutus uh, beast or something like that. So the names, uh, for the most part, when they when they are applied, which is not that often, uh, tend to be kind of descriptive of either their appearance or their behavior. Uh, Backpack, who is kind of a, a webcam viewer favorite, he got his name because when he was a, a spring cub, he spent a lot of time clinging to his mother's back, riding around uh, on her back um, when he would Try to, when she would try to cross the river, he'd ride on her back. And so, uh, a very obvious name, and, uh, but that's also kind of interesting because we don't usually name cubs. They're hard to track once they get to be sub-adults even. But backpack's behavior was so interesting as a cub, and then with the broken leg the following year, he was very easy to follow through those difficult first few years. Uh, Bead Nose, one of the, the first bears that I I uh, got to know when I when I started working here, she had a cub that would never leave her side. Fun with the name sometimes, you know, like um, Ted is Ted's nickname comes from triangle, not, not from him being a teddy bear or anything. Um, the Wayne brothers, which you might hear somebody refer to at some point on the on the web page, they were named after Bruce Wayne because they had pointy ears like Batman, and we thought that would be very cool to name a, a bear Batman. So Bruce Wayne seemed like the thing to do, or the Wayne brothers, because they always did everything together. Uh, I don't know, do you have probably some, something to add to that? Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, I think the next question, I think, is one for Roy in particular. Um, how did you get involved with the Explorer? I find it to be an amazing teaching tool for my five-year-old. And uh, thank you so much for fostering a love of nature with our children. Well, it was, it was a just a great day for me when Explore contacted the park to see if we were interested in the webcams. I'll give you just the briefest history. We tried to do a webcam, we meaning the Park Service and, a, and another organization we partnered with, the Pratt Museum in Homer, Alaska. We tried to do a webcam uh, back in 2008 and we encountered a lot of technical difficulties that we, we almost overcame, but it came down to uh, the fact that we didn't quite have enough money or expertise to keep the cameras running all of the time. And when they were running, um, sort of, um, we were we were impressed by the number, but all we could have, all we could afford to have online at any one time, watching the cam uh, was 25 people. And uh, looking over here at the stream right now, oh, the numbers have actually dropped a little bit. We were close to 6,000 people on uh, the Falls camera just a little while ago. And now we're um, over 4,000. So. And it's something that the Park Service would have never been able to afford, even though it's something we believe very strongly has a lot of value. We, we just didn't have the time or the expertise to do it. So we sort of shelved that project for a few years. And then um, last year in the spring, Explore contacted us. They had already done a number of very successful webcams around the world, including the polar bear cams in Churchill, 
in the fall, and then they have um, panda cams. And I'm sure most of you have seen the, uh, it must be 50 or so of them right now on the Explore webpage. And um, so they had a lot of experience doing it, and I had a great conversation with the folks at Explore, and it seemed like something we could pull off. And so last year was, last year we were sort of just trying to get the cams to, to work. We had problems with getting internet out of here and, and getting all the infrastructure in place. But it's always been a goal to try to make them not just a novelty on the web, but to make them truly this interactive educational experience for everybody where, where those of us that work here can share our experience with the bears. You can watch them live on the cameras and even to facilitate the conversations amongst yourselves where you're sharing the photos and the things that you saw last night while somebody was having dinner and didn't see it, sort of a virtual campfire thing, uh, which is the same thing that happens here in camp. People congregate in the campground around the campfires, they congregate in the lodge after dinner, and they talk about the neat things they saw throughout the day, and everybody's got digital cameras, so they're all showing their cameras, saying, look at the shot I got, look at this one I got earlier today, and, and it's exactly what, what the, the viewers around the world are able to do now with these webcams. So. I know everybody here in, in Katmai and um, the National Park Service in general are very, very proud of this, this um, arrangement we have with Explore and so happy that everybody watching seems to really be enjoying it. So, you know, thank you for that question. Oh, there was another one, um, uh, a, a reminder that if, if we're throwing out all these names uh, of bears and their numbers and nicknames and you're, you're wondering where you can find that information, there are uh, three different ways you can get it. On the Explorer webpage, uh, just below the, I think it's below, yeah, uh, right below all of the various webcams that you can pick on the right side, there's a tab that says Profiles. That will give you 15 of some of the most commonly seen bears on the falls. And then, um, where do the files go? Oh, where it says Live Chat right now, I think it usually says Files. And from there, you can download a PDF of a book that, that Mike and, and other staff members here put together um, that profiles about 50 bears. You can also go to iTunes if you have an iPad and do a search for brown bears of Brooks Camp and get um, even a few more bears, a whole lot more photos and some videos, uh, which give you a, an even more detailed uh, view of the bears and, and, and the ecology of, of Brooks Camp. And uh, we hope to update those uh, sooner rather than later. Um, I'm not really sure when I'm going to get to it because um, it's it's very busy here with the webcams and everything else. Um, but look for that to be updated sometime later this summer or um, definitely in the fall. And uh, yeah, well, try to try to get it out as soon as we can. My goal would be to try to get an update after the July season is over when we have time to actually take some photos, observe some new behavior. Um, you know, like, we'll want to document that scar that's on Otis's head right now because the existing book doesn't have that. And if we would have rushed to put one out in June, we wouldn't have even had any idea which bears showed up or what scars they had or, or any new information over the one we did last fall. So we'll try to get one out um, sometime in August and then maybe another one at the very end of the, the season, you know, sometime in October uh, to sort of recap the year. And that's something we plan on doing every year. So you can, you can save... The PDFs you can you know save the the iBooks and, and just keep getting different ones every year so you have a record of the bears from and the activity from each year. Um, so let's see there there was another question and that one is uh, are there strict restrictions for the fishermen, uh, i.e. a limit of how many salmon they can take for example? Yes, there are. Um, there's actually uh, two layers of regulations here. There's federal regulations that are specific to Katmai. And then there's also state regulations as well. Um, so the state of Alaska manages the sport fishery uh, throughout much of the park, and uh, then the park can uh, can also have um, stricter regulations, for example, that limit what fishermen can do. Um, along the Brooks River, for instance, it's a very, very popular sport fishery. Uh, so they, that means they have to take their lines out of the water completely. Uh, sometimes people will just reel in just a little bit and then they'll have their, their sort of flies drifting in the water, but they need to have everything taken out of the water uh, when a bear is within 50 yards of them. And that's the, to ensure that bears aren't associating fishermen with fish. And this is especially crucial early in the, the, the salmon run because the bears first arrive and they're extremely hungry. Springtime really is starvation time for the bears. 
they really are eating almost nothing but grass, unless you're really, really lucky uh, and you end up finding an animal carcass or you're good at hunting moose calves. Um, and we don't have a lot of moose in Katmai. So the bears really are losing weight fairly continuously throughout the spring. So when they get here in, er in late June and early July, they're extremely hungry. And any sort of splashing fish just attracts them. And the bears can come bolting down the river from several hundred yards the way they go after the fish. So we always are trying to prepare uh, anglers uh, to to be be aware of bear encounters, be prepared to break their line and release the fish if they're playing a fish and they're trying to get it in when a bear approaches. Uh, and also, if you're um, in the Brooks River and you wanted to keep a salmon, for instance, the only place you can keep a, a, a fish is downstream of the floating bridge. So when you're watching the lower river camp, for instance, out towards the mouth of the lake, the downstream portion of the river, that's the only place that people can keep a salmon. And the restrictions there, those are park specific and those are, are fairly, um, fairly strict as well. You can only keep one fish per person per day um, and there's no place to clean it here at Brooks Camp. There used to be but the uh, septic system in the area couldn't handle um, all the fish guts getting flushed down. And then the bears just smelled fish guts all over this building. So all they were trying to do was get into the building the whole time. So right now there's no fish cleaning within one and a half miles of Brooks Falls. And that includes the mouth of the river. We tend to see most people fishing. The next question we have is, what do these bears eat after the salmon stop running? And I guess we should give you a, a, a little rundown of salmon run here and we'll focus mostly on as far as the bears are concerned. The first of the sockeyes start to enter uh, the 14th or 15th or so of June that we see the first salmon, like one, maybe two, and then a couple of days later a few more, and a couple of days later a few more, and it doesn't really hit big until about the first of July. And then for about uh, two and a half, three weeks, we get um, a lot of salmon coming through. Um, what did they say our statement was for this year this so far? Over 930,000. So into the Naknek River from Bristol Bay, over 900,000 fish have come in so far this year. About a third of those on most years make it to Brooks River. So during July, what we're seeing are that, that big wave of salmon, that run of salmon coming in from the ocean, moving into Brooks River and some of them beyond Brooks River. And they continue up into Lake Brooks and go to the spawning areas up there. Some of the fish, many of the fish, will stay in Brooks River or, or, or in Lake Brooks just right where Brooks River starts. They'll, they'll linger around throughout August, but the bears during that period of time uh, tend to move away from Brooks Camp. There may be one or two bears that will stay here. Often Ted is one that, that we'll see around. And uh, the other bears will go uh, and follow that main pulse of the salmon to the other locations, like Margot Creek, uh, which is on Neck Neck Lake, or uh, Headwaters Creek, which is on Lake Brooks, or they'll disperse out into the tundra and begin to eat berries and grasses and squirrels or any other, any other uh, source of food that they can find. Now, by uh, the first part of September, the salmon in this river have started to spawn and die. Uh, during most of August, they are just uh, swimming around, sort of holding their place in the water, trying not to get eaten, trying not to burn too much energy. Some of them will go rest in the cooler parts of Lake Brooks until the main spawning occurs, which is in September. So then for a couple of weeks, they're spawning up and down um, Brooks River. And that's when the eggs are laid, they're fertilized, and, and um, the females will, will perhaps lay several nests of eggs in a, in a collection of them of them called the red, um, and she will defend them against other females that might choose to dig in the area to also lay their nests, and will be um, trying to be as attractive to the males cruising through the stream as well. So they'll lay the eggs and they die. All salmon die after the, uh, the spawning occurs. And they, uh, when they die, they will drift downstream a short distance and they will collect on the gravel bars and in shallow areas, uh, especially around the lower river. And that's what makes the lower river so exciting to watch in in uh, September and October and even into November a little bit. When I say exciting, it's not like 
Brooks Falls exciting where the fish are jumping and there's lots of fighting over the food and, and lots of activity. Remember the fish are dead, so or, or nearly dead, so they're very, very easy to catch. These bears are also enormous at this time, hardly recognizable from their July forms, uh, just really, really fat. So very easy to, to, to get more fish um, and they sleep a lot. Uh, and when they're not sleeping, they're walking very slowly around the lower river. And they will, for the most part, continue to eat those dead fish all the way to the point they go to their dens for the winter. And that's what makes this run of, of salmon, this sockeye salmon run, so critical to the survival of the bears uh, in this part of the world. They rely so much on that marine source of, of fat and protein, that salmon run. And, it, and in the case of the, the run up Brooks River, it occurs at just the perfect time for them because uh, there's still plenty of dead fish in the river when the snows start to fall and they go to their dens. So if they are still around here, it's easy to keep collecting fish. And so they don't really have to even resort to eating grasses or, or, or leftover berries or, or, or risking injury to themselves killing moose in the fall because they can eat these salmon right up to the point they go into their dens. And really everything here is, uh, is, is based on the salmon. Uh, the survival of the ecosystem, really as we know it, uh, depends on the fish returning. Uh, without without the salmon, the densities of bears and catmint probably would be much much lower, uh, and maybe similar to areas of the of the continent where you don't have really large runs of fish. Denali, for example, you know the grizzly bears there, they don't really have access to salmon. Of course, in the Yellowstone region, they don't have access to to salmon either. Uh, so the densities of bears and catmint are extremely high. Uh, and we have, to, to give you an example of that, the, the, the park is about 4.1 million acres or so, um, and there's uh, over 2,000 bears estimated to be within Katmai National Park. Uh, a, a park like Denali, which is around 6 million acres, just has a few hundred bears, and I can't remember their exact estimate. It's somewhere around 600 bears or so. So you can compare a, a park that's larger, like Denali, much, much larger landscape, but they have actually fewer grizzly bears because they just don't have the food resources there to support large numbers of bears. And we do here, and that food resource is the salmon. So you call them grizzly bears in Denali and brown bears here. You wanna explain yeah, that? Yeah, so the, the difference between a, a brown bear and a grizzly bear is, is sort of arbitrary. Um, if you were, uh, let's say, a biologist uh, 120 years ago, let's say it's like the 1890s, um, you may have been uh, classifying like uh, something like a dozen different brown bear species on, around North America. The Yellowstone bears would be different than the brown bears that you find in British Columbia and then each drainage would have these different ones. And uh, Right now uh, grizzly bears and brown bears are considered to be the same species. Grizzly bears are considered to be a subspecies of brown bear. Uh, so they're all, their Latin name is all Ursus arctos. And then the subspecies that grizzly bears are included within would be uh, horribilis. And uh, the brown bears that we have here are simply just Ursus arctos. Uh, the difference between the two really is somewhat arbitrary. Really, it's if you're a brown bear, you have access to salmon. I think that's the easiest way to think about it. Brown bears have access to coastal food resources, marine resources. So salmon, wheel carcasses, clams, something like that. And if you're living too far away from the ocean to have access to those food sources, then you're generally considered to be a grizzly bear. And then in North America, there's also another subspecies of grizzly bear too on Kodiak Island. And those bears are virtually identical in their habits as the uh, brown bears here on the Alaska Peninsula where Kalmai is. Uh, but their morphologies, their skull morphologies is a little, is a little bit different. So uh, they have been uh, separated out into a separate subspecies of brown and grizzly bear. But even over in Europe and Asia as well, too. So Asian brown bears and brown bears in Europe are the same species as our grizzly bears and our brown bears here in North America. So we're a little more than halfway through the, the hour that we've allotted for the chat. And we're sure there's some people that are uh, newly arriving. Maybe had they had some technical difficulties at the beginning um, and thought we'd just take a, a brief opportunity to introduce ourselves again. My name is Roy Wood, and I'm the Chief of Interpretation for Katmai National Park and Preserve. And I contribute to, uh, answers on the on the uh, explore.org webpage uh, as Ranger Roy. And to my right is Ranger Mike. Hi. And uh, Mike also contributes to uh, answering your questions on, on the explore.org webpage. 
And, and I, if I uh, uh, if I don't get to your questions, I apologize because I'm somewhat selfish and I'm usually out watching bears. When I'm not working. So. <laughs> and one thing, we love the fact that everybody's interested in it, but a lot of your questions are, are so good and it takes us a while to answer them in writing. And we're answering them. And before we know it, there have been 70 new comments and we sometimes lose the question we were trying to answer in the mix. So when that happens, please, it's, you know, we apologize. We're, we're doing our best to try to, to keep up with them. Um, but, but keep them coming. We love trying to answer it. And it's very rewarding to know that so many of you are paying attention to the bears and, and you know, wanting to learn about them uh, as, as we try to do around here every day. Uh, so let's see, there was another question that just came in. Um, and this one, I, I'll pass this one off to Mike because um, this one is, who is the most dominant bear at the falls this year, Mike? The most dominant bear at the falls, actually, I, um, I've observed is, is number 856, and he doesn't have another nickname. Um, to me, he's just 856. It's kind of his name. Um, and he was, I think, if I remember correctly, maybe first seen or first identified along the Brooks River uh, as far back as 2004. I think he may have actually been a, um, a sub-adult there at that time. So he's really um, risen in the hierarchy. And uh, one, of those, uh, one of the things I do when I go to Brooks Falls on my own just to watch bears is I keep track of the hierarchy. Uh, so I have a little notebook with me, and I just um, make little notations. Anytime I see really bears interact with one another, um, so if a bear displaces one another, for instance, uh, pushes a bear out of a fishing spot, I'll keep track of which bear ended up displacing the other one or which bear avoided another one. Uh, and I, over the past uh, few summers, I have not recorded really an instance where 856 yielded to another bear. In fact, most other bears, they simply just avoid them. They don't want really anything to do with them. So uh, some of the other really dominant bears up at Brooks Falls, number 814, who's nicknamed Lurch, um, and number 747, those are two really dominant bears, and really no one pushes them around, but they all avoid, both of those bears avoid 856. So he seems to have um, a, a slightly aggressive side to him, and he will approach those other really big dominant bears every once in a while to remind them that he is kind of the boss around the falls. However, the hierarchy constantly shifts. Um, something could happen, A56 could get in a fight um, with another bear, he could get injured for instance, and then maybe he'll be yielding to some of those other larger bears. Um, maybe in, uh, he'll have a poor summer where he's not able to get a lot of fish. It doesn't seem like that'll be this summer, but maybe next summer, who knows. And um, when he ends up coming back, if he's a little bit thinner, some of those younger bears that are growing in size each and every year may be able to challenge him as well, too. So the hierarchy is definitely not set. And as a bear ages and it starts to maybe um, uh, lose its ability to compete with some of those younger males that are rising in the hierarchy, then uh, you may see 856 actually lose a few of his uh, his preferred fishing spots at Brooks Falls, he may get pushed out by some of those younger bears. So it'll be very interesting in the future to see which one of those up-and-coming younger bears are going to be top dog at, at the falls. Because we have 856, who's really the most dominant from what I've been observing. Then you have like 814 and 747 that are a little bit lower, and, and 218, who's ugly as well, the nicknamed ugly, he's also um, up there. And then, uh, yeah, he's not really an ugly bear. He's a very <laughs> handsome bear <laughs> it's a, from one side. From the yeah. other side, sometimes not so handsome. So so the, all of those bears are very dominant at the falls, but definitely 856, I think, is the, the most dominant this year. That dominance thing is always a fun one for us to witness and, and to talk about because it, it's what leads to a lot of the, the interesting behaviors up at the falls, the jockeying for the best fishing spot, and sometimes just a glance across the river where these, you know, mm -hmm. these two almost equally dominant males' eyes meet, and then they've got to go, you know, argue it out. Uh, fun to watch. Most of the, most of the, um, the, 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 uh, most of the interactions between the bears up at the falls are just posturing. Um, it's either avoidance or posturing. Almost, you, it's very rare, actually, to see a really knockdown drag drag-out fight. It happens once in a while, but it's almost always uh, one bear avoiding another, or they size each other up, there's a lot of yawning. Maybe there's a little bit of roaring. They're jawing one another, for example, but they rarely come to blows. Um, every, I think everyone understands that bears can inflict severe punishment to one another. So even a more aggressive bear doesn't necessarily want to risk that if it doesn't have to. So 856, he's confident enough um, in his size and his disposition to be able to push a lot of other bears away. So he'll just confidently approach them and almost all the other bears will move out of the area. However, if he encounters a new bear that comes down to the falls this year, and that one is very dominant, then maybe it'll take some posturing to sort of, for them to sort out which one 
is more dominant. And if that doesn't work, then maybe it, they will fight one another. But it's extremely rare to see bears fighting. We, um, we'll see it just a handful of times per summer at most. The next question is, if you raised a baby cub from birth, would it never hurt you? I think we would all like to think that would be the case because the, the cubs are so, so adorable, uh, but they grow fast. They, um, you know, they've got a lot of sharp, pointy things, claws and teeth. And, and, you know, it's probably, as it reaches adulthood, it's probably not going to have uh, the fear of you that a wild bear would have. But I've talked to some people that train uh, brown bears over the years, and they say that they're always being tested by it the bear, sort of the jockeying for position thing, like um, uh, the bear will try to occupy the same space that they occupy for no apparent reason, you know, just just standing right there, sort of nudging you out of the way, and, uh, you know, so that they don't make good pets, as I think most people would expect, and um, you may be fine if you raised it from birth, but then again, you know, it is a wild animal, and um, very, very few people around the world would have the expertise to deal with that kind of behavioral challenge or, or the bear proof place to let it roam. Uh, you know, there's a reason if you, you see a bear in his nose. So um, adorable as cubs, great to, to watch. collection of bears at the falls now. We were at the falls 10 years ago around this time and we saw only three bears at a time. Uh, not necessarily. For instance, also has something to do with it too. Uh, later in July, for instance, a lot of our bears will find the fishing harder uh, at, at Brooks River. So we'll start to see less and less bears as the month progresses. Really, sort of the prime time, the highest number of bears along the Brooks River tends to be the middle of the month, middle of July. And then less and less bears as we continue throughout the month. So those are a couple different factors uh, that may have influenced why you saw less bears at the falls. But sometimes you get unlucky, too. I mean, you could be there at the right time, at the right day, um, and there's almost no bears there. Uh, I remember being at Brooks Falls one year in early, or excuse me, late June, um, and there were salmon everywhere, and there was just one bear at the falls. And he was cleaning up. I mean, he was leaving salmon carcasses all over the place, but there were no other bears at that time. Um, so I think a little bit of luck, but also more than anything else, maybe the uh, depending on whether or not the bears are satiated and um, the time of the month to affects you know how many bears are at the falls but definitely this is the time period where there's the, the most amount of bears at those falls let's see the skype queue is empty let me look on um, explore.org's web page and see what we have the first oh the top one yeah do you radio do you radio tag or collar or tranquilize the bears in order to identify them and the short answer to that is no we don't um, at Brooks camp uh, tranquilize the bears currently to do any work on them. It's been a, um, probably 30 or 40 years since we last did any work like that around Brooks Camp. They did some along the coast of Katmai after the Exxon Valdez oil spill because the oil did come down as far as the uh, and a little bit beyond the Katmai coastline, the Pacific coast of Katmai. And um, we um, we don't do that around Brooks Camp for a number of reasons. Um, it's difficult to do around water, for one thing, because if you tranquilize a bear, you don't want it to run and then pass out in the water. Imagine being in waist-deep water trying to drag a 900-pound tranquilized bear out or hold its head out of the water until it's no longer tranquilized enough to drown. So it's not a situation you want to find yourself in. And uh, so we don't do it for, for that reason. Um, and we're really just lucky here that we see the bears so regularly and often so closely because of the viewing platforms that, that we can see those individual identifying marks that allow us to track the individuals over time. 
rather than having to tranquilize them every now and then, uh, examine the tattoo in their lips to see which bear it is, um, you know, take blood samples and all, all of that stuff. It's good science that the people are doing, but we're lucky here that for the, for the work that we're doing, we can do it just by observing the bear and keeping copious records of their behavior, their identifying marks, and um, you know where they like to fish, where they don't like to fish. All those things contribute to our ability to recognize them from year to year and avoid putting brightly colored tags in their ears or radio collars on them or handling them. And um, you know, a couple of days ago or a week ago, people were asking why we didn't go tranquilize 469, the injured bear, and try to get it some help. You know, one part of that too is that we don't have the the tranquilizing equipment out here. It's, uh, it's stuff that we would have to bring in uh, folks from outside of the park to do. And then we would run into those same issues of tranquilizing the bear around the river or a lake and how do you prevent it from, from, dr from drowning or injuring itself, getting away. So uh, at this time, it's not something we do. Uh, that's not to say that in the future, there won't be some project that would benefit from that sort of uh, effort. But right now it's not the case. So when you come here, you will not see ear tags, collars, or anything on the bears. The, another yeah, no, next question, um, do wolverines go to the falls? I have never seen a wolverine at Brooks Falls. Uh, I'd like to. Um, so if anybody is watching the cams and they see a wolverine, um, get a screenshot of yeah, it. That would, that would be awesome. Uh, they, they do use this area. Um, I've seen them along the Knack Lake shoreline, fairly close to, to the river. Uh, so it's definitely probably within the home range of, of at least one wolverine. Uh, so they, they are in the park. Uh, we see them once in a while, but their densities overall are pretty low. Uh, so I've never seen them at Brooks Falls. We do happen occasionally to see other animals up at the falls as well. Uh, occasionally wolves have actually come down to fish at Brooks Falls next to the bears. And that could be a real treat to see. I don't think anybody's reported um, anything like that this year. But that is uh, something that we've observed in the past as well. So. Uh, you never really know what's going to show up. I mean, look for a moose even um, to show up on the, on, the, on the cameras once in a while, especially later in the season when the, the bull moose are maybe migrating uh, towards their running territories. You may see a few of those passing through the area. So the next question um, starts with the preface, maybe a dumb question. Um, and it, this one makes me laugh because this is one that, uh, it's not a dumb question at all. It's a, it's a very good question. I don't know that we have a good answer for it, <laughs> but it's a very, very good question. And that is, uh, why do most of the bears face upstream when they are fishing, um, when the salmon are coming behind them? And uh, that is true, that for the most part, the bears either face upstream or maybe crossways in the stream and, and, and catch the fish when they're coming up. And if you're on the lip of the falls, you know, they, they are facing downstream, they're facing into them, and that's because they want to see them jump up over the falls so that they can intercept them as they go. But as for the ones just in the river, the only thing that really comes to mind for me, and I, I'm anxious to see what you say about this one, because I get asked this a lot, but I don't really have a good answer. And that is that, like, uh, like if you're passing the baton in a marathon, you don't pass the baton by running at one another. It gives you few opportunities to adjust and, and, and accommodate that. Uh, you know, handing off of the baton. Likewise, when the when the fish are swimming just past the bear, the bear just has to match that speed somewhat with it. He doesn't have to anticipate exactly where it's going to be at some future point in time, um, which is harder to have that eye, mouth, paw coordination through water. I mean, that's a difficult thing to do. So as it's coming past him or her, they can sort of pounce on it and grab it, I think, more easily. But you know what, that's just the way I'm thinking. I have no idea why the bears choosing to do that. How do you answer that one? Well, I, 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 would, I wouldn't know with all the bears, but I, I think some of the positions at Brooks Falls that the bears sit in, like in the jacuzzi, lend itself to facing upstream because a lot of the fish will be pooling, maybe um, in, that, um, in that plunge pool right below Brooks Falls. So you get this water circulating. It's really foaming. Um, the, the fish may have a harder time swimming through that area, they may get the shore. And then some of them will jump and they jump right into the falls. They jump like right through and they hit the rock. And maybe that stuns them for a period of time. And the bears are able to sit there and wait for the fish to make a, a mistake. Uh, and they can just take advantage of that situation. 
Um, so with, with some of those fishing spots up at the falls, I think the bears face the falls knowing that the fish are going to make a mistake right next to their feet. Um, and maybe they just don't have the room to turn around or, whatever, or it could be too deep or something like that. I'm not really sure. But it seems like certain fishing spots at Brooks Falls really do lend itself to facing the falls. And, uh, and if they were facing their way, maybe they would have less fishing success because they wouldn't really notice if uh, the fish were behind them and, uh, and were, were being stunned or anything like that. We probably should have just said because their mothers taught them to yeah. teach that way because <laughs> the, the, the way the mother bears teach them plays a, a large part in their, their later um, behavior. Uh, and I'm going to answer this one. Okay. Uh, the next question is, why is there no sound on bear cam? And the reason there's no sound is because I've asked them not to turn the sound on. And uh, the reason is that uh, the, the webcams are attached directly to the bear viewing platforms. And the microphone, we've got microphones out there. The microphones are, are just a couple of feet below where the cameras are. So they're, they're right about the level where the visitors on the platform's feet would be. And the microphones are capable of picking up what people are saying on the platform because they're fairly sensitive. And we've done our best to try to angle them away, but you, you can't put a really big directional like parabolic microphone down there because it would be too much of an attractant to the bears. Uh, so these microphones can pick up visitors standing on the platform and we felt that it was too much of an invasion of privacy of the, the people standing on the platforms because there's sort of an expectation that when you say something you know, out there watching the bears that you are not broadcasting to five to 6,000 people at the same time you're saying that. And so we didn't want to subject anybody to that. Now, if you've been paying attention and watching the cams a lot, we turn the sound on about 10.15 or 10.30 at night, and it goes off at 7 in the morning on the falls cam. The lower river platform camera will remain silent until uh, camp is shut down in mid-October. And when the camp is shut down, then we intend to turn that on, and that will be on the whole time because there won't really be people out here. Uh, it'll be just the bears, the gulls, uh, and the things that, that people said they wish they could hear. So. I know that disappoints a lot of people because I see the question come up many, many times a day, and I try to answer it when I when I see it. But it's 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 to not um, invade the privacy of the people that are on vacation here. So I, I apologize if if it upsets you, but it's something the park feels really strongly about not doing. And I let my iPad go to sleep, so I yeah, don't know if we've got another question. Yeah, we do. Um, is uh, is eight five six at the falls right now? Um, well, we're I'm trying to get the. Uh, our, our page was paused. I'm trying to get it to reload here. It might take a second for us to reload because we have limited network uh, capability out of here and we don't want to ruin the quality of the webcams in order to turn on another cam view to, to see it. So I'm looking now and um, it's it's hard it's hard for me to say. It looks like there, it could be. There's one bear that's fishing downstream, or excuse me, feeding uh, downstream at the falls right now. And that's a spot you... Usually that um, 747 or 856 will actually feed at. I think that's maybe 747 right now. That looks 747 yeah. to me. Yeah. Um, Especially the way he was mm -hmm. like a puddle just spread out there. Yeah, uh, you know, each one of those bears, it, it, it's it's interesting to see how they, they just have slightly different um, ways of doing almost everything. Uh, 747 and 856 might fish in the same spot, and he just went right back into the river um, to to fish in his, his spot. Uh, when they when they catch a fish, both of those bears will leave the river almost always. It seems like they go to the island and feed, but eight five six usually goes up onto the island just a little bit more for whatever reason. I don't know why. Maybe he just wants them to take a little bit of a break from the water. Who knows? Uh, so yeah, in the jacuzzi, if you're looking for eight five six, um, that's one of the spots that he prefers most. There's a down log that's uh, sort of parallel to the flow of the stream about halfway across Brooks Falls, and 856 will fish there as well, too. So look for him to be in um, either one of those spots. Uh, there's uh, several other bears in the area right now. Um, there's one that's uh, very close to the falls and facing the falls right now, and that happens to be uh, the one in the screen that I see right now um, closest to... Um, to the camera is the one nicknamed Otis. And then there's one uh, that's uh, a little bit further away from 747 in the jacuzzi, further away from the camera. 
and that happens to be number 218, who's nicknamed Ugly. Um, and that, he's a favorite bear of many people around here, because he's great at fishing practically anywhere. There are certain places where he likes to fish um, more often than others, but he can go anywhere. So if uh, 856 came down and said, hey, I want your spot, and, and, uh, and 218 has to leave, he may go to the lip of the falls, or he may go to the far side. Or maybe he'll go somewhere else downstream and be able to fish successfully. And there's very few bears that actually can do that. Some of them, will, like we talked about before, will only be able to fish one spot. Um, and that's about it. A bear that a lot of people like um, to see, who's on the cam right now too. He is the one that's furthest away from the falls. Just sort of standing there is the one nicknamed Ted. And you can kind of see the scar in his hip right now. Ted uh, doesn't seem to appear to be a really great um uh, great fishing bear. He uh, oftentimes begs from a lot of other bears. Many of the bears seem very tolerant of his presence. Um, so he is often standing downstream, maybe not necessarily trying to catch his own fish, but he's waiting for leftovers. Uh, so you definitely will see a lot of different fishing styles at the falls. Uh, some that are more active, some that are more passive. These bears fit standing there and sitting and waiting really aren't expending any calories right now. So they're practicing really good energy economics because they're even when they uh, sit there for an hour and don't catch any fish, they're really not expending much energy either. Um, and then you have other beggar bears uh, occasionally, like uh, like like Ted um, and bears on, on the lip of the falls. There's one there now, um, you know, exploiting that spot as well too. So here's the the last question that we have, and it's um, a, a request to sort of recap one of the earlier topics, and that is is uh, Bear 469, the one that uh, webcam viewers call Patches, is, is he going to be okay? Well, we don't know. Um, he has been showing improvement over the past couple weeks or so, but we, we don't really know if he'll actually pull through. Um, as, as Roy mentioned earlier, he, he uh, made it through the hardest time of the year, and again, we don't know how he got injured, we don't know exactly when. We basically just know that he showed up with an injured leg. Uh, but bears are very strong animals, they're very resilient animals, and they seem to have a remarkable ability to heal from significant injuries. Uh, and when that bear first arrived at Brooks Falls, he really wasn't putting any weight at all on that left hind leg. And now when he is walking through the water or along the shoreline, he is uh, putting some weight on that leg. So it, it's quite possible that he's going to make a, a full recovery throughout the summertime. But again, we don't really know. That's one of the dramas I think that we're going to try to follow throughout the year here. And um, when you see, you know, these bears fishing at the falls, you can probably uh, probably think that almost every one of them has had a fairly significant injury in the past. Maybe not something like a broken leg, for instance, but definitely um, uh, very large open wounds, for instance, that they heal from all the time. I think Ted is a classic example of that. Um, the bear actually that he's standing behind right now ended up giving him a very large wound I think back was in 2007, um, and he completely healed from that. We've seen other bears, cubs, for instance, with broken legs, bears with broken jaws at Brooks Falls as well. And you look at some of these bears and their injuries, and you think there is just almost no way they can pull through this, but some of them do. Um, so it's quite remarkable for me to see these bears healing from injuries that certainly would, would maybe outright kill me or it certainly put me in the hospital for a long period. And Mike mentioned the resilience of, of the bears. They're physically tough and resilient, but behaviorally too. Uh, 469 had never been seen uh, in July at the falls. He was always a bear that showed up in September after uh, the spawning was pretty much over and when there were very few people around. He seemed to be very uncomfortable around uh, the large numbers of people that are here in July. And perhaps his injury led him to adapt his behavior in order to um, to better heal himself by getting the food during the peak of the salmon run. So his need for food and his and his desire to adapt and change outweighed his his fear of, of being around humans that, that he held for many, many years, because I think 2001 was when he was first seen here, right? I Something think so, like that. yeah, 2001. So um, anyway, very amazing animals, very uh, adaptable, you know, powerful, and uh, the, the cams provide all of us a really wonderful opportunity to, to view them almost 24 hours a day. I mean, I was looking late, late last night, and you could barely make out some bear, uh, bear outlines in the jacuzzi. So uh, just a really neat opportunity, and we're, I think everybody here at the park, Mike, myself, everybody on the staff, we're 
just so excited that you all are as interested in, in the Bears of Brooks Camp as we are. And we intend to do more of these chats. They may not always be uh, video chats. They are sometimes may be like Twitter chats or some text-based chats. We also intend to do some of them out at the falls where perhaps we can do some um, you know, more of a blow-by-blow -blow description of the behavior and the action that we're seeing. But um, we will try to do more of these over the next couple of weeks, and we hope that you all tune in to, to join us. Uh, I know there's another one, I believe, tomorrow night, same time, with Chris Morgan, who's been the host of several nature television shows and um, uh, one of the hosts of a recent BBC production called The Great Bear Stakeout. So I think everybody should tune in and, and, uh, and check out that chat tomorrow afternoon. And I'm not sure when our next one is, but keep, uh, keep watching on the, the Explore.org page. And um, if you haven't signed up for the email with Explore.org, make sure you do that so that you'll get an email whenever we schedule any more of these chats. So thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in. It's been a lot of fun. And we'll be online and try to further answer questions over the next hour or so. So thanks for joining us. Have a good night.